Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this panel entitled The Journey to Scaling Education Innovations, The Ins and Outs and the Ups and Downs. My name is Anna Muru, and I work for VVOB, Education for Development, and uh, we offer uh, technical assistance to governments in the field of teacher professional development and school leadership. I am delighted to be the moderator of this panel today. As you have heard from a lot of the sessions that we have been following uh, over these two days, we are not far off from 2030, but we are very far from achieving the goal of inclusive and uh, equitable quality education for all. The education needs globally are immense, and improving learning at scale is a matter of urgency. But scaling up locally effective education innovations to many different contexts and then sustaining them is proving to be quite challenging. Today we will hear from people who work with organizations that are very involved in scaling education innovations across the world and who over the years have gathered significant experience and expertise in this field. Let me start by introducing you to the panel. So first of all, we have Laura Poswell, who is the executive director for JPAL Africa, and she will be joining us online. Laura, are you with us? Great, welcome, Laura. Uh, then we have, in person, we have Tom Vandenbosch, who is the director of programs for VVOB. And welcome, Tom. Thank and then you. we have Devyani Prashant, who is the head of international collaborations from Pratham, India. There she is, Devyani, welcome. And then we have uh, Girish Menon, CEO of Stir Education, here with us in person. Thank welcome, you. Girish. Then we have Boris Bulayev, CEO of Educate. Welcome, Boris, here in person with us. And then uh, we have Dr. Taheran Pazuki, who is a lead manager of Magrid, also joining us online. Um, I don't know if we can see her. No, we cannot. So there she is. Great. Welcome. Um, this is a very short session. We only have 45 minutes, and the topic is very rich. We have planned for a question and answer session afterwards, but should we run out of time, please feel free to approach uh, the panelists uh, afterwards and we can give you their contact details as well. So now we'll go straight into the session. I will allow each panelist to give, uh, to give us a bit of uh, their own experiences on innovations which are, have either been scaled or which are in the process of uh, being scaled. And uh, then we'll have a discussion about it. So I will hand over to you, Girish. You can start with us. Thank you very much, Anna. And good afternoon, everybody. And good day to all of you who are there online, wherever you are. Uh, it is such an amazing opportunity to talk about innovation and scaling up. Uh, so I represent STIR Education. So a little bit about us. Uh, the reason for our existence is we believe that education systems everywhere must prepare every child for an increasingly complex world and it's more important now than ever. And our mission is to support education systems to reignite intrinsic motivation so that every child, every teacher, and every official is motivated to learn and to improve. Uh, as a young organization that was set up in 2012, across India and Uganda, we have reached out to 6 million children and 200,000 teachers. So that's a little bit about STIR. I'm going to talk about our experience in the state of Tamil Nadu, which has a population of 68 million people. Just to put it into context, a little more than the population of the entire United Kingdom. Uh, Tamil Nadu is a state where we, have, we started work in 2018, and our approach is that of a system-wide approach where we work with the governments in terms of the professional development of teachers. And, and at every step of the way, it's in partnership with the state government. And the approach is centered around building intrinsic motivation and promoting a love for learning at, at every level of the system, be that the of children, of teachers, or of the education officials. And during COVID, it was a great opportunity for us to see how we could respond to the system, uh, to the situation. Having started only in 2018, we were in three districts, 
of the 38 districts in the state, there was a bit of a paralysis, and people didn't know what to do. And that's when our team started discussions with the state government and gently started this point about, you know, we can't just sit and do nothing. We have to respond. So what do we do in terms of responding? We put together a program based on what we understood as the needs of the teachers. Uh, we had a robust plan which was co-created with the government. So it is not about us pushing a plan or a program with the government, but it was trying to offer that support and the dialogue so that together, in partnership with the government, we could come with an approach that met the real needs of teachers that was at that time, at the beginning of the pandemic, not quite understood. And the result of that was in a few months, the government recognizing the power of this joint offer that we had, decided to scale it up from three districts to 13 districts, which is now covering a third of the state. Uh, and, and therefore, in terms of numbers, it meant reaching out to 47,000 teachers and 1.1 million children. And for that to happen, the state government which was responsible for the education at the state level, uh, had an, a memorandum of understanding that was agreed with us so that they were there to provide the political and the policy backing so that the districts and the district level officials could feel confident of engaging on this partnership. So a very quick review of the key levers of what we thought worked in the situation. Uh, one was it was all through working with the existing government machinery. So nothing was Nothing was stir branded. Everything was with the government system. The second was about building capacity at the district level, because that's where we realized was they were at the fulcrum. They were there uh, between the state at the top and teachers at the, the, at the uh, ground level. So that level of, of the districts was really, really important. The alignment with the existing state policies and practices was really important so that we were not coming with something that was a generic approach, but something that spoke to the context in that particular state. And it was, um, and, and, and that kind of gave us the momentum and the leverage to reach to several districts without significantly increase our own staff strength. We pretty much had a broad, broadly the same staff strength, but we redivided the responsibilities within ourselves so that we could actually reach out. But any system or any approach is not without its challenges. So in conclusion, these are the few key challenges about maintaining and increasing the focus on the resources that are required. It's so easy to fall back to what it was. And I think that's where we still feel that it's a bit of a challenge to say, hang on, this is not just something that was relevant for the pandemic, but this is going to be relevant going forward as we build back better. Uh, it's important to also manage the transition because the government changed in the state, and that meant that officials also changed. So how do we continue to build the momentum with them? To continue to demonstrate the success of this uh, because we are working in a very short time frame. So how do you continue to bring the government along on that journey? And very importantly, as you've heard so many other speakers, how do you make sure that this benefits every child, every teacher, and every official, irrespective of uh, you know, their gender, the, where they are, their class? Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's, it, it is embedded as a universal approach. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Girish. That's very interesting, and uh, it's great that you managed to respond so quickly and at that scale. Uh, if you were to share with the public what you think were the two critical things that you believe have resulted in your approach having traction with the government, the buy-in with the government, which ones would they be? So one thing that our state team did was, right at the beginning of the pandemic, sometime in March, uh, just as we were thinking of what needs to be done, they conducted a survey and they reached out to over 23,000 teachers. And the simple question they asked the teachers was, what, what do you want? You know, what, what do you want the system to do to help you be better teachers? And that information was not available. And when the teachers responded with that, that was really powerful. You know, there's always power in the numbers, but there's also power in the voice of the teachers themselves who said, this is what we want. We want to deliver education, and we want to deliver education in these very difficult circumstances, help us to find the right solutions for that. So that is the first thing. And the second thing was, it therefore resulted in a very strong partnership between the state level and the district level, so that the 
while the efforts were very much at the level of the teachers in schools and in classrooms, it required the entire machinery to work rather than just one bit of the machinery switching uh, or shifting a few levers here and there. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for that. Okay, now we can pass over to Boris from Educate. So, Boris, you can start by presenting your, um, your experiences and then we'll have a discussion there as well. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you, honor to be here with all of you. Um, so at Educate, we work to prepare youth in Africa with the skills to succeed in today's economy. Our long-term vision is to design solutions that measurably impact millions of youth per year. And today, we're the biggest youth skills provider in East Africa, reaching 46,000 youth intensively with evidence-based experiences and serving over half a million youth more broadly. Uh, today, I'll share uh, how we scale our core uh, experience through education systems. At the root of what we do, we've created a core experience with the most essential skills uh, youth need in a post-primary or secondary education. Uh, to transition to the world of work and the labor market after. Um, we've seen this core model delivered directly to over 850 schools per year and 34,000 students in Uganda lead to a variety of outcomes long-term like transferable skills, educational attainment, and employment and income. In response to these results, we wondered how could we, and how and if we could scale this through the system. And so upon invitation, we partner with governments to help reform secondary education to better build skills uh, for the future and for youth in the world today. We believe that reforming secondary education offers the most scalable, sustainable, and cost-effective way to develop the next generation, to have the entrepreneurial and transferable skills uh, they need to succeed. And we found that you don't actually need to reform the entire curriculum to do so. We've implemented uh, this solution, uh, working through the system uh, in uh, Rwanda and Kenya, and focus on three steps. The first is changing policy, so integrating core uh, pedagogical and curriculum structures to give youth experiences. Two, training teachers. So in Rwanda, we've run a, we've co-created a two-year teacher training model to help this policy change turn into practice at the school level. And three, we've worked on sustainability structures and incentives in partnership with government to change things like assessment and exam uh, to help these uh, behavior change last. Um, we believe that by working with government on a single secondary subject curriculum reform, we can improve meaningful, we can, le we can meaningfully improve secondary education at a faster, cheaper and more politically easier way than full comprehensive reforms. Our work in Rwanda is very much a continuation of the journey to build an evidence-based model to do this. In 2019, in a randomized control trial, we saw four years after leaving uh, secondary school in our, our model in Uganda, the youth uh, were building skills like grit, creativity, self-efficacy. We're seeing higher secondary graduation rates. Uh, women were seeing a 25% increase in university enrollment. We're seeing higher earning majors, uh, more business and STEM degrees, as well as a bunch of gender equity, family planning, and sexual and reproductive health outcomes, including uh, a 21% decrease in delayed family formation. So the question was, could we achieve these same outcomes through the system? So we ran an evaluation to do so and found in the model I, I shared about previous in the slide before in Rwanda, that we, you, we were setting youth on the same track. Uh, we saw six months after completion of secondary in the model delivered by the national education systems, by the national te uh, curriculum's teachers, um, a doubling of university enrollment for all uh, and a much bigger impact for girls. We saw 167% increase in university enrollment um, and a 16% increase in business ownership. To get there, we've had to really focus on the key reasons why reforms fail. Uh, we spent a lot of time studying this and why we don't have all the answers. We have found a few things that really drive um, success and which, which lead, lead to less successful reforms. Um, so the first is reforms are often too complex. Um, everyone tries to overload all these different policy changes and they don't really mean much to teachers on the ground. 
So in response, we fight for a few key wins co-designed with governments. Uh, we have a framework called the, the central change, which focuses on the key thing that you want to change in the system and aligning curriculum, uh, teacher training, and assessment bodies against that change. The second thing we found is that teachers often don't own that change. Um, and in response, we try to pilot with teachers uh, before the curriculum even rolls out, the policy even rolls out. And then we roll out a national teacher training to really help teachers own it, delivered by teachers themselves. So it feels like you could, if I see another teacher do it, why can't I do it? And lastly, uh, we focus on addressing the lack of sustainability uh, by um, ensuring coherency and accountability throughout the system. So again, aligning, uh, aligning assessments, school monitoring, and other bodies around consistent, consistent metrics um, that assess student activity uh, and real experiential learning. So, thank you. Great, sounds really exciting. Um, you've mentioned a lot of data in your presentation. I wanted to find out how has generating rigorous evidence and data been important in your journey of scale? Yeah, it's been really important. Uh, I think it's helped us in a variety of ways. One, it's just taught us what happens with youth. Uh, one of the most surprising things we learned is that if we make youth better off, they, uh, and they make more money and start more businesses in the short term, they'll actually use those resources to put themselves into further education. Which kind of makes logical sense, but not something you would immediately expect, uh, especially in the markets that we work. Um, two, it's helped us learn. So there are a variety of things that we're improving in Rwanda based on things we would have still liked to see in, in the evaluation. Three, it really drives our strategy. Um, everything we do is rooted in evidence and we're now working to take this experience to out of school youth based on, off another set of evidence we have. And lastly, I think we're looking for really, because we're trying to design solutions for, to measurably impact millions of youth, we're really looking for breakthroughs. And I think the evidence guides us to where we may be onto something or where, when we, we may not. Great. Thanks so much. Okay, now we'll pass over to Deviani. Deviani, I hope you're ready for us. Excellent. Maybe you can give us yes. your piece. Thank you, Deviani. Thanks so much, uh, Anna, and thanks to everybody that we just heard from. Uh, so my name is Deviani, and I'm from Pratham Education Foundation in India. Uh, I'm also part of the Teaching at the Right Level Africa Central team. Uh, and we've been working together with our partners in Africa to take up for us to teach in the right level. Uh, Anna mentioned at the start of the panel as well that there is, uh, you know, a lot of information, a lot of interest in now scaling up education innovations uh, because there is growing evidence of the learning crisis. Uh, so we often find that there's a lot of talk about the challenges, but there's lack of, you know, simple solutions that can really improve outcomes at scale. And this is really the, the gap that Pratham's teaching at the right level approach uh, is aiming to fill. I hope you can see my slides because I can't see them on my screen, so I don't know what you're looking at. Um, so what, what are we doing with um, the teaching at the right level approach? Uh, some key elements, just so that we're all on the same page. Uh, teaching at the right level uh, uh, aims to improve children's basic foundational reading and math skills. Uh, and it starts with, you know, clearly articulated goals for reading and math. Uh, and you can see here on the screen a simple assessment tool uh, that is used to group learners by level uh, and not age or grade and to track progress over time. Now, when we're working with education systems, how do we begin? We begin by creating leaders of practice uh, who learn by doing. So actually get involved with the approach uh, in order to be able to lead and support uh, teachers, instructors well uh, as they move forward uh, with this kind of innovation. And it's these same sort of leaders of practice who are able to provide ongoing support to teachers. Uh, but why do teachers need support? What are they doing in the classroom? So they're using this kind of assessment tool to group children by level rather than by age or grade. They're using fun, engaging activities. Um, in India, we call it combined activities for maximized learning or Kamal uh, that can be adapted as children progress. So children are uh, learning in individually. They're learning in groups. They're learning as a class as a whole. And these activities helps to accelerate their basic learning in reading and math. 
Now, how do we know that this is working? Of course, we are doing, you know, these simple assessments on a one-on-one -on -one basis, not just to get started, but also to track progress. And we ensure in teaching at the right level programs that there are strong measurement, mentoring, and review systems uh, to support implementation, but also ensure that the data uh, and the experiences that are coming out of the program uh, can be uh, used for quick decision making. So if we go to the next slide, what's been really the journey with scaling of teaching at the right level? So we started in India and it was a gradual scaling process initially, uh, but then we saw rapid growth across the country, we're reaching millions of children every year, not just by programs that we are implementing directly, but working with government systems at scale. So what have been some of the pathways to scale for us uh, in the Indian experience? The first was to really build a demonstration model, you know, understand ourselves that this works and to be able to show at scale that this can work. The second was to really engage community, ensure that there is buy-in, uh, that we're trying to solve a problem that is really a problem that is owned by everybody. And at the same time, working with government systems to find ways to take this invention to scale. So today in India, we're working across 21 states and multiple states here uh, are in large scale partnership with government. So we saw that, you know, we were able to develop uh, and test in India, you know, engage in large scale partnerships with government. But alongside, we also had a research partnership with JPAL where we were trying to understand the effectiveness of the approach. And today the approach has gone to multiple contracts, uh, contexts across the globe, more than 15 countries now across the globe. Uh, we have partners implementing teaching at the right level, but of course most of these are in Africa, uh, most because a lot of countries in Africa have sort of the need uh, for an approach like this. And what really has been this process of taking the approach from India to Africa uh, the first is, you know, making sure that we're contextualizing for from the start, uh, including understanding the problem. You know, today we have a lot of data on basic skills. When we started out five, six years ago, this data was still being developed. Now, making sure that whatever you are doing in the new context um, is working, right? So doing whatever it takes to make sure that we know that this is working uh, and we're not just scaling up based on, you know, a process that seems to be working well. We've also been very focused on cost, so ensuring low cost, ensuring effectiveness and simplicity, but at the same time, con continuously improving programs. Uh, today in Zambia, for example, where we partner with the Ministry of Education and with VVOB, uh, we've seen that the uh, program has been scaling up steadily over the past four to five years, but at the same time, every year we're making some improvements to make sure that the scaled up version is better than the previous level of scale. Uh, we've also learned that it's important to take learning from one context to another, not just expertise. So we're not going and saying, you know, here, this is how TARL is done, but we're also going in to say, this is what we've learned. Uh, now let's see how we can apply it to this new context. The growing, uh, you know, body of data and evidence uh, around TAL has also helped to build confidence and validate that this approach can really uh, be useful in new contexts. And we've worked with partners across the globe to make this happen. Uh, with teaching at the right level, Africa, Pratham and JPAL have come together to create an initiative to really support the growth of teaching at the right level on the African continent. And across the continent and in other countries uh, across the globe as well, uh, we're working in large scale partnerships with governments. Some where we as teaching at the right level Africa, for example, or Pratham are engaging directly with governments, but also through partners who are trying to work at large scale with government systems. And what we've learned along the way is that sustainability is really core to the design from the start, right? You have to be focused on making sure that whatever you're building uh, can really be integrated into the system and owned by the system. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, along this way, of course, there have been, you know, some enablers, uh, but some sort of speed breakers as well. So one very important enabler has been uh, that there is a clear need for improving foundational literacy and numeracy. But at the same time, there's been this sort of lack of focus on foundational literacy and numeracy within education systems. So this body of data and evidence around teaching at the right level has really helped to sort of shift systems to help them think, uh, you know, first understanding the problem, but then also seeing that this kind of solution is possible in another context. As we've scaled up, we've also seen that system capacity and bandwidth is often limited. 
Uh, so how have we tried to overcome this, some of our levers on going to scale, is really ensuring that we're building together from the start, you know, with our government partners, with NGO partners, making sure that we're contextualizing but developing an approach together right from the beginning and making sure that we are simplifying and leanifying uh, the program with each stage of scale, as was in the case of exam uh, the Zambian example that I was giving. Another uh, you know, interesting uh, reason why teaching at the right level is scaling up rapidly is that there's demand really from multiple contexts for evidence-based solutions. But at the same time, you know, we as Pratham, as Teaching at the Right Level Africa, as VVOB, all of us partners working on Teaching at the Right Level have limited capacity and often don't have complete understanding of new contexts. So how have we really gone on this journey of scale, really partnering with like-minded organizations to ensure we start delivering results quickly? So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Devyani. Very nice. Uh, partnerships keep on coming as a very, very important feature in all this. I think I'll pass on to Tom from VDOB to go to give us his um, his experiences. So, Tom, over to you. Thank you so much, Anna, and good afternoon, everyone. I'll presenting uh, our experiences with scaling effective school leadership uh, in Rwanda, scaling effective school leadership for quality and equitable education. So basically, what's the innovation we have introduced in Rwanda? Um, there are five standards of effective school leaders which, which were developed by the Rwanda Education Board. And on this slide, you can see the five standards, including creating a strategic direction for your school, leading learning and leading learning processes, leading teaching and leading teachers, managing the school as an organization, and working with parents and the wider community. And the program uses two modalities of continuous professional development for school leaders in Rwanda. The first one is an accredited and certified initial training course for school leaders. And that's quite unique in the world that school leaders actually have to go through a course to become a school leader. Because what we find in many contexts that the school leader is just a promoted teacher and a teacher which has maybe a number of years of experience or is a, who is an excellent teacher gets to be promoted to become a school leader, but then sometimes you lose twice because you, you lose an excellent teacher and you get a mediocre school leader. So that initial training course is quite important. And then the second modality is a continuous professional development of these school leaders in professional learning communities where they discuss their own problems, their own challenges, and also come up with their own uh, solutions in their own regions. Now, if we look at the scale of this innovation, it has currently been scaled to 17 out of the 30 districts in Rwanda, so covering a bit more than half of the country, reaching more than 2,900 school leaders, and future plans uh, include the scaling to the whole of Rwanda. The process which was followed includes the following steps. First, there was the establishment of this school leadership and management unit within the Rwanda Education Board, because this unit has really uh, been very critical and has driven the development and also the, the, prof the, prof the professional development of these standards for effective school leadership, but also the scaling uh, process. There was the piloting and researching of the different CPD approaches, which has also been uh, quite critical in the process. And then there was the decision to scale a combination of this initial teacher, uh, th this initial training uh, through the diploma course together with the professional learning communities, which was basically a decision made by the government. And there was a whole process of comparing different options. They also compared it with different other innovations they had available, about 26 different innovations uh, they looked at. So they really started owning uh, that innovation right from the start. The other way around. Now, what have been some of the key levers and challenges uh, faced when scaling? First of all, the establishment of that school leadership, uh, school leadership and management unit has been an important anchor at the national level. Because to take this to provinces and to districts is important, and to take this to schools and school leaders, but you also have to have that national support. A national support unit within the Ministry of Education, basically convincing the highest polit political level of the importance of effective school leadership. Then these five professional standards for effective school leadership in Rwanda have also been 
quite critical, and they were based on an international, well-researched framework, but the framework was contextualized to the specific situation of Rwanda, and that also took quite a process. Then the professional learning communities of school leaders, they are being facilitated and coached in a neutral way by sector education officers and, or sector education inspectors, as they are named now, and their job descriptions include the coaching and mentoring of school leaders or groups of school leaders, professional learning com communities of school leaders in their job description. And then also the gradual implementation has allowed the implementers to learn and improve. We haven't trained all of these school leaders all at once, but we trained them in different cohorts, allowing us to continuously improve the intervention and continuously improve uh, the courses. And especially with the COVID-19 crisis, this has been uh, quite instrumental as well, because we had moved the course already to a blended environment. It was already being de delivered in a blended way, but this allowed, it, allowed us also to quick quickly change it and also deliver it completely in an online uh, modality. So that's all. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, what are you excited about in terms of uh, creating broader scaling opportunities in Rwanda and abroad? Yes, thanks, thanks for that question. Quite exciting. As I mentioned before, we will move this to national scale in Rwanda. We'll also have particular focus on new school leaders because there's many new schools being built. There's a big expansion in the education system. So definitely to do some good onboarding of new school leadership. And interestingly, the Ministry of Education of Rwanda, about two weeks ago, she also announced that uh, from that experience in Rwanda, she will build an, an, an African center for school leadership, allowing other governments and other partner organizations across the continent to learn from the Rwandan experience and actually to leapfrog the interventions that they want to implement so that they don't have to go maybe through the same long journey because this process I described took them about a decade or so. So we think by building on the experiences of Rwanda, as I said before, it's quite unique, for instance, to have that certified training course that some of the interventions in other contexts can now move maybe a bit faster. And the African Center for School Leadership will be quite instrumental in that. Really exciting indeed. Wow. Amazing. Okay, let us go now to Laura. Uh, Laura, maybe you can give us your experiences. Laura, we can't hear you. Uh, now we can. Go ahead. Great. Um, um, so I think when we work with partners like education partners, primarily helping with that technical. And our partners are in design of the concerned program. And some work follows the scaling process, but perhaps what's most interesting in terms of our contribution is really both helping to understand very deeply the local context that need, and then mapping this to global lessons that we've been learning from programs across the world and what the drivers of impact must be. And we try to put these together to help policymakers build programs that should be more impactful in their environments. Next slide, please. So I'll talk about an example we're working on in Nigeria in terms of girls' education and empowerment. This is a fairly new program. Um, we basically, the goal of it is to reduce dropouts of secondary school girls and improve well-being. Um, next slide. Um, and the reason for this is that evidence suggests that life skills can improve enrollment by motivating girls and giving them practical skills to pursue education. So the reason we're doing the work is that uh, the Katsina state government in Nigeria asked us for support along these domains. Uh, we ran a needs assessment to understand the barriers to enrollment and the roles girls play in their own enrollment decisions in Katsina state, so we could understand this for that context. And then we spent a good deal of time building a toolkit that uses evidence and program details from 36 impact evaluations to provide a step-by-step -step guide to program design. So this entails really, again, talking about partners, it entails working across a range of stakeholders to very carefully try to unpack what we call the mechanisms of change or those things that we think are most likely to drive impact. So we work with researchers, we work with implementing partners that have run some of the more successful programs. 
We've learned with worked with the local experts and policymakers to try and pull the relevant um, set of evidence together and um, program suggestions, essentially. And um, that's where we are for now. Our next steps are to go through design workshops to be able to develop the program of work that should be the most impactful. Um, can you have the next uh, slide, please? Thank you. And so the scope is that the idea is that this program, which is supported by uh, seven state governments in Nigeria and the World Bank, um, should roll out over five years, after which there's a mandate for school integration at scale. Um, so as our other partners have been talking about this, we've been trying to build in um, an approach where government will hold this um, on their own by the time it scales properly. And we've built in um, continued learning and adaptation kind of model and philosophy. And next slide, please. Some of the key levers that we are um, enjoying, I would say, at the moment, are firstly that we're working with partners that really recognize the value of an evidence-based approach to help define the language around what even we mean when we talk about life skills, what the impacts can realistically, um, what they are that can be realistically achieved, and what it takes to get there. Um, it's also helpful to look across programs to try to kind of boil down the critical elements that drive change um, and then, as our other partners have talked about, very careful and thoughtful contextualization and building in this continual learning model. I think the key challenge, and there's many, but the key challenge is always trying to balance effectiveness and institutional um, integration. How does one build a program that should scale well, but retain the fidelity of those impact drivers that should ultimately do better by our beneficiaries? Thanks. Thanks a lot, Laura. Thank you very much. Um, JPAL is supporting uh, scaling education innovations from a different uh, perspective, uh, a different angle, rather, comp uh, you know, compared to the other organizations here. Do you see a particular gap that you're filling in this space? Yeah, it's, it's extremely tricky to actually pull out the lessons from often sophisticated academic work and make sure that it makes sense for often different contexts but also takes account of the operational realities on the ground. And so we found there to be a real gap even when people really want evidence in their programs to be able to operationalize that well. So we built the skill internally to try and kind of bridge this gap from research to policy to practice um, and be able to really take those lessons, those impact lessons, and support our partners through a process which is often medium term. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot, Laura. Thanks. Now I think we'll move on. We're running out of time. We'll move on to Dr. Tehran, and uh, we would love to hear from you, Dr. Tehran. Uh, maybe you can give us your experiences uh, in in scaling, and you know, just just share the most relevant learnings from your uh, from your experience. So over to you. Hi. Uh Thank you very much uh, for having me. I'm uh, Tahere Pazuki, uh, founder and CEO of Letmouth, uh, where we create a technology-based solution for children with special education needs. So directly into uh, like uh, uh, making inclusion, and uh, we are based in, in Northwest Europe, uh, in Luxembourg. Uh, and uh, our journey uh, started back in 2014. Uh, in the form of a research study to better understand what are exactly the needs of uh, like special uh, education children, uh, starting from children who are having migratory background. Uh, here in Luxembourg, over 60% of children who start schooling, they are second language learners, which means that they never heard the language of instruction, <clears throat> which is Luxembourgish before, and we uh, we see that there is a there is always a gap between native speaker and non-native speaker, and this gap continues to grow over the school years. So, in the first place, we try to like close this performance gap uh, among uh, these two groups, and uh, so we created a solution that is uh, independent of uh, any languages. We created a solution for young learners to train their uh, cognitive and early math abilities. And we started then testing it uh, all over Luxembourg uh, and also together in Germany and France uh, on over 25 schools and 300 children. And uh, we like run the testing for over two years and the results were impressive. So we 
could see over 70% of performance gain uh, on different groups of children and also more importantly uh, the children and also their teachers they were very involved and engaged in the learning process so teachers they could finally understand whether um, the low performance of the children on the, uh, these uh, competencies are due to language barrier or is due to the uh, understanding of the concept and also um, uh, on top of that like the, um, the lost confidence that the children they were experiencing they, it was back and uh, that was a great uh, great gain for us and then after that uh, once teachers started uh, making a request to the schools and to the uh, to their municipality for requesting the, the solution that we uh, developed so after that the, the ministry of education in luxembourg they evaluated themselves and they um, bought the licenses and implemented in all public schools in luxembourg uh, so today over 10,000 children uh, 600 schools uh, and many teachers are using Magrid in daily um, uh, teaching and learning and uh, as, I, as I mentioned uh, it was a part of a research study so uh, as soon as we published the scientific uh, result of the study we started getting requests from all over the world from South Africa to US to Brazil India Turkey and then that was the moment where we realized that it's uh, this problem it's um, very huge and there is an um, unmet need for that so uh, then we, we also had to uh, scale up quickly and uh, so somehow based on our experience um, getting into the uh, educational sector as much as it's uh, difficult given that it's like a conservative sector which is totally understandable it's about children it's about education very delicate but um, we felt that as soon as there is a solution that can really help children and teacher and educational system they are open and they are willing to uh, take it and try it and taking it to the next step so today now we are present in uh, within europe in france germany luxembourg uk belgium and out of europe uh, in the us in brazil and in iran so yeah so our uh, also at the same time like expanding the market expanding the solution so we are working on different group of special education needs on autistic children hearing difficulties language disorder dyslexics dyspraxia and also um, expanding globally so I, I try to keep it very short as we are short in time Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful and exciting to hear. Um, I don't think we'll have the question answer session. Unfortunately, we're hoping to have another round of questions uh, to the panelists, but I don't think we'll manage. Uh, I think we'll conclude uh, at this point. I'd like to mention that the experiences of, of many of these organizations that are here today have actually fed into uh, what is called the Education Scalability Checklist. And you might be interested in reading more about it. It's a good guide and a good toolkit to actually guide in uh, you know, further scaling of your, um, of your operations in education. It's an open source which is available online and you can please feel free to approach the panelists to get more information about it. I have seen that there are some publications on the seats, on the chairs rather, um, about them. So please uh, feel free to look into them as well. Um, some recurring issues that we have, uh, we have heard, some recurring actually themes that we have heard uh, among the panelists today is the importance of data, the importance of research, and the importance of partnerships, that these cannot be uh, under, underestimated. So uh, with that, I think we will uh, just uh, thank all the panelists for uh, their uh, engagement. Thank you very much to those online and those in person. Um, it's been great, and I also would like to thank uh, the participants today, both online and in person. Thank you very much for participating in this uh, discussion.